Okay, hi everyone. So, lovely to see such a large number of people willing to turn out to acknowledge our finitude and mortality. That, that's impressive on the part of everybody. I'll just tell you a little bit about the, the event series that this is part of. It's a Royal Institute of Philosophy talk, of which we organise in the University of York two a year because we're an affiliate. Uh, the Royal Institute of Philosophy is the largest charity in Britain with the aim of making philosophy more accessible to the general public. It was founded in 1924 and its founding aim was to explore matters which constitute the deepest and most permanent interests of the human subject. And it was aimed at making the best teaching on these subjects as accessible to the thoughtful general public of London. So now they've obviously geographically broadened a bit. Um, we're delighted tonight to have Oliver Berkman. He is an author and thinker who's reported out of Washington, New York and London but he is also from York. Between 2006 and 2020, he wrote the Guardian column, This Column Could Change Your Life, one of only two columns, along with Tim Dowling's, that I read every week when I used to <laughs> buy a print version of the Guardian. He's also the author of three books, Help, how to Become Slightly Happier and Get a Bit More Done, The Antidote, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking, and the one that he'll be talking most closely, uh, or his talk tonight will be most closely relevant to, that's most recent, is 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. And if you'd like to hear more from him on a regular basis, he writes a bi-monthly newsletter called The Imperfectionist that you can sign up to on his uh, website. Um, so thinking about the Royal Institute's statement of intent from 1924, I would say that Oliver has definitely explored matters which constitute the deepest and most permanent interests of the human spirit. I'm amazed when I read him about the range of intellectual disciplines that he draws on to illuminate things that seem to be of the utmost importance. On the other characterization the Royal Institute of Philosophy gave of its mission to make the best teaching on these subjects accessible to the thoughtful general public of London, I wouldn't really say that I think of him as primarily engaged in that project because that project sounds as though it's where there are some ideas or theories that have been propounded in a different venue, say an academic journal or an academic seminar, and now the public philosopher or public psychologist is coming along and serving a conduit, as a conduit for those ideas and presenting to them, them to a wider audience. Uh, whereas one of the things I've always hugely enjoyed about Oliver's work is that it seems like he's teeming with ideas and theories that are absolutely not just taken from ideas that have been developed independently in academia, but that are entirely original with him. So, yeah, I'm going to pass over now to him and let's hear from him just to let you know that after the talk, Oliver will be signing books outside. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, that's a really nice introduction. Um, personally, I'm kind of slightly anxious about doing a talk under the auspices of uh, philosophy, you know, because um, obviously I think what this book is about and the stuff that I write and talk about is, is clearly philosophy in some sense and I can 
do that whole thing where you defend self-help as a kind of philosophy because uh, that's what ancient philosophers were doing, at least in part, you know, producing things that were intended to help. Uh, but I'm a sort of a hanger-on when it and a, ro a groupie when it comes to professional philosophy. I'm kind of interested and love interviewing professional philosophers, but I don't think I have maybe the the discipline of thought that I see in in uh, professional philosophers and ability to sort of construct an argument in a very very disciplined and rigorous way. W one thing I've noticed that professional philosophers do do, which I really like, is they use the phrase um, in conversation. You use the phrase to a first approximation when they are talking about something they haven't really like, got to the bottom of yet. I think it translates as, uh, what I reckon is. <laughs> um, and so a lot of what I'm going to say this evening is basically uh, some things that I reckon about our relationship with time. I think that's kind of defensible, though, because actually I don't think the most important value of this kind of conversation, or this book if it has value, is, is in sort of mounting a detailed argument that you then sort of are obliged to accept. I think it's much more about trying to uh, trigger a little bit of a, a shift of perspective. It's a, it's a different, slightly different way of being in the world, or even just, to put it bluntly, a kind of an existential crisis, really. So I would feel like I had done my job at a talk like this if, if I had triggered an existential crisis <laughs> in you. I think it's an existential crisis that's really like worth going through. I don't think it's just it's not just for my sadistic pleasure. It's um, it, it's a it's a kind of a uh, it leaves you on the other side of it, you know, um, knowing and feeling something new about about um, the world and, and and time. I guess I build this book around two basic truths when it comes to time, and obviously the first one, the really obvious one, is that life is really, really short and finite uh, in a kind of a terrifying way. Uh, the late philosopher and broadcaster Brian McGee has this brilliant, um, well, I think philosophers would say it isn't a thought experiment technically, but it's kind of a, a set of thoughts that, that illustrate this really brilliantly, I think. He points out that like somewhere today, probably in York, maybe in Heslington, you know, somebody is turning 100. That's a pretty common occurrence these days. It's somebody's 100th birthday. If you take that person and you go back to uh, the day that they were born, there was somebody turning 100 that day. And you can do the same thing the day that person was, the, the day that, um, the, the day the person who turned 100 then was born, there was somebody turning 100 then. And so you can envisage this kind of chain of centenarian lives going back through history. And the point that McGee made was that, you know, we think about human history as unfolding in this incredibly glacial way, these long, slow periods called things like, like the Middle Ages and classical antiquity and the interwar period. But if you think about history as consisting of these, this end-to-end this -end chain of hundred-year-old lives, all of whom are like real people, right? We don't know who they are necessarily, but real specific people, you only have to go back 35 lifespans to get to the golden age of the Egyptian pharaohs. You only have to go back, what, 20, 21 lifetimes to get to the time of Jesus. It's like five lifetimes, I think, maybe six, to get to uh, Henry VIII being on the throne of England. It's this extraordinary uh, sort of concertinering effect where you suddenly realize that the whole of human civilization has really taken place by at least that standard in, a, in the blink of an eye. McGee liked to point out that um, to span the whole of what's commonly understood as human civilization uh, 6,000 years, you'd need only 60 people, which was roughly the number he could squeeze into his flat for a drinks party. <laughs> And of course, if, if everything humans have done by that, by that, um, uh, in that way of thinking is, um, is, is something that's happened incredibly briefly, an individual human life is, is almost too short to, 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 to comprehend. Um, I call this book 4,000 Weeks because very broadly speaking, very roughly speaking, uh, I rounded it down a bit to get a nice round number, but that's, um, that's the average lifespan in the West 
at least uh, today. And when I first figured it out, I went around asking my friends to estimate just off the top of their heads without doing any mental arithmetic how many weeks they thought, um, they thought uh, uh, a human could live. Uh, I say it in the book. One of my friends said 150,000 weeks, which if you don't do the maths just does seem kind of, it doesn't seem crazy um, at first glance. But 150,000 weeks, if you double it, and add a little bit, 310, to get 310,000, is the number of weeks uh, that is the duration of all human civilization since <laughs> the ancient Sumerians of Mesopotamia. So it's radically not uh, the case that we get 150,000 weeks. And of course, it's not just that we have limited time in a quantitative sense, right? It's that we have incredibly limited control over that time, over how our lives and how time unfolds, at least compared to how we, what we might like uh, uh, to have. In the book, I try to unpack some of the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, which is, which is fraught for multiple reasons, like his um, impenetrable prose and his literally being a Nazi uh, for at least 10 years. But he does have this wonderful, useful word, I think, uh, which I think in... I think is pronounced Gewurfenheit in his, in his writing, which usually gets translated as thrownness. And the idea is just that we find ourselves, or my version of his idea anyway, is just that we find ourselves thrown into time. We're not, we're not, we don't get an amount of time to then spend as we will. We just find ourselves in this moment of time, uh, completely vulnerable to what might happen next, completely unable to do anything but sort of live forward into the next moment. It's the case for all of us at any moment that absolutely anything within the laws of physics could happen in the next moment and uh, there's nothing you can do about it. So I'm building the existential crisis here. So. <laughs> the other big truth, I guess, I mentioned two sort of fundamental truths that I sort of started off with in writing this book, is that, um, is that we pretty much all struggle in some sense with time. It's like a fraught relationship that we have with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And obviously sometimes that's to do with reflecting on these deep questions about, um, you know, how long a life is and, what the, and what, what the meaning of being here at all is. But a lot of the time it's something much more uh, mundane. It's a sort of low-level sense of dissatisfaction or, or struggle. And the obvious uh, the, the really obvious version of this for many people is just being too busy all the time, having too much to do. It's actually really strange when you think about it that so many people are afflicted by a sense that they must do more than they can do in the time available. Because if there's any uh, uh, ethic, eth philosoph ethical philosophy fans in the audience, you'll know that this is a violation of the idea that ought implies can. You can't have a duty to do something if you can't do that thing. It doesn't make any sense. And yet, many, many of us go through our lives, go through our days, feeling that we really ought or must be doing uh, more things than there are actually hours available in the day to do them. And it's really strange that we call this busyness. I always like to make this comparison with Richard Scarry. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Busy Town. This is a... This is a world where, you know, it's kind of a weird world in certain ways because the, the um, different careers are occupied by different species of animal. Um, it's like a closed shop union thing or something. But, um, and, but the point about all these animals, these, you know, the, the pigs who are the firefighters and, the, and the, the raccoons who are the firefighters, I get mixed up anyway, and the, and the, the pigs who run the grocery, which sells bacon which is strange. But anyway, they all, they're, really, they're really busy. That's the whole point about Busy Town is everyone's busy. But they are busy and they are happy. And the reason that they're happy is not because there's anything good about not being busy. It's because they, they know, you have the sense, I believe, that they have enough time to do the things that they're doing. Nobody's overwhelmed in Busy Town, right? They're busy because they have this sort of beautiful fit between all the things they have to do in the course of a day and the time in the day that they have to do it. And that is radically not our situation uh, when, we're, when we're feeling overwhelmed by, by email, by, by all the demands of uh, ordinary life. And then there's, 
in addition to the sense of just having too much to do in the time available, there's this sense that even when you do an awful lot of it, you don't quite get to the things that, that really matter the most, that you're always sort of postponing the things that really matter to just get through a whole lot of stuff that needs to be done first. So it perpetually feels for many people, I think, like, like life is sort of going to start a bit later than, than now, which you can, it's sort of an idea you can deal with if you're 20, but it gets progressively harder as you get older to believe that like the, the moment of truth is coming later. And once you're sort of in your late 30s and onwards, it becomes very strange to imagine that it's going to be at a different time than now that life really gets going. In the meantime, quote to the essayist Marilyn Robinson, it's like we, we, we live in a state of what she calls joyless urgency, the sense that we've got to get somewhere, but we're not quite sure where. And until we get to that place, we're just doing things that kind of have to be done. They're not the main, the main purpose of what we're doing. And so there is this sense of sort of provisionality in our relationship with time a lot, of, a lot of the time. Sense that like this isn't quite really it. That this is maybe a dress rehearsal that we're going to get ourselves in and better control of our time, but, but it hasn't happened yet. There's a lovely quote from Arnold Bennett in his excellent little book, How to Live on 24 Hours a Day. He said he was writing for my companions in distress, that innumerable band of souls who are haunted more or less painfully by the feeling that the years slip by and slip by and slip by and that they have not yet been able to get their lives into proper working order. And even when you are using time in what feels like a very responsible fashion, even when you're sort of like gaining qualifications or putting together projects or prudently investing your money for the future, all, the, all these things that feel like non-negotiably good uses of time, there is still this sense that it's not for now, that it's for later. Um, I love this line from Alan Watts. Uh, giving one example of this. He says, take education. What a hoax. As a child, you're sent to nursery school. In nursery school, they say you're getting ready to go to kindergarten. This is in the US. And then first grade is coming up and third grade. In high school, they tell you you're getting ready for college. And in college, you're getting ready to go out into the business world. People, like, people are like donkeys running after carrots, hanging in front of their faces from sticks attached to their own collars. They are never here. They never get there. They are never alive. And where this really started to get interesting for me, uh, like researching and writing about it, is that the real problem here seems to be that irony rules the day when it comes to our attempts to deal with this situation, right? It's not just that we have so little time, so little control over our time, and it all kind of sucks. It's that the more we try very often to get into more control of over our time, the more we try to use time well or to bring calm and peace of mind to our experience of time, the worse things get. So one thing that I'm sure many people here have discovered is that if you get, if you get sort of overwhelmed by email and you resolve to get really good at processing your email and really efficient and like up the tempo at which you're dealing with email and response, responding to email, the main thing that happens is that you get loads more email. <laughs> It's kind of obvious, really, isn't it? Because you reply to people, and then they reply to your replies, and you have to reply to their replies, and you get a reputation for being responsive, so people send you emails if they've got problems they need solving. And if you're kind of a bit rubbish at responding to email, if you can get away with that in your life situation or your professional situation, you actually find it's really useful quite a lot of the time, because people just like find another someone else to solve the problem that they were trying to have you solve, or they were the, some crisis they're worrying about doesn't ever quite materialize and by the time you get to the email it's obviously not something you need to you need to worry about and this obviously is familiar in ideas like Parkinson's law right the idea that the work expands to fill the time available for the for its completion if all you do to try to deal with the time problem is get more efficient at using it all else being equal that just attracts more and more inputs into the system and you're busier <coughs> than you were before. It's like when they widen um, motorways to reduce traffic congestion, that becomes a more appealing route for drivers, so that more cars are incentivized to use the system, and then the congestion returns to being just as bad as it was. And you see the same irony in the technological ways that we've developed to try to save ourselves time. I always think this is a really 
fascinating and frustrating case of this problem, right? Because we've got all these things that are supposed to deal with the time problem by helping us travel much faster than before or receive and answer electronic messages much faster than snail mail can do it or heat up food in the microwave in three minutes instead of having to wait two hours for it in the oven. But it's way more frustrating to wait three minutes for food in the microwave than it is to wait for food that's in the oven. And if you've ever worked in an office with a shared microwave, it, it's always stuck at like eight seconds and you have to cancel it before you can put your food in. Not because that was the exact amount of time that the food should cook, but because like that's the moment at which the last person like gave out in frustration. <laughs> they could not handle those last seconds. Um, there's a whole set of other examples of this. I won't go into all of them, but there's this fascinating book um, the historian Ruth Cowan wrote called More Work for Mother, where she shows effectively, I'm summarising, simplifying a lot, but that as all the supposedly labour-saving devices that um, American and European housewives, who it overwhelmingly was, began to get access to in the early part of the 20th century, they didn't end up saving time or labour at all because all that happened was that the standards of the social expectations of cleanliness just rose to offset the benefits. So if you can't really keep your rugs and carpets spotless and free of dust, there isn't a social expectation that you, that you should, but as soon as you can, there's a social expectation that you must, and then you end up doing the same amount of, you end up investing the same amount of time in cleaning rugs as you did uh, before that. And it's not just that um, our efforts to get control of time lead us to have more to do. It's that it also seems to exacerbate this, this meaning problem, right? This problem where um, it becomes uh, harder and harder to focus on the stuff that, that really matters. I was a sort of obsessive user of productivity techniques and reader of time management books for, for years. Re writing that Guardian column was... Um, was a big part of it. It was kind of enabling. You know, I say in the book it's like being an alcoholic employed to write a wine column. It's a little bit too convenient if you've got a kind of neurotic fixation on time management systems to get to review them and write about them for work every week. But one thing I discovered was that the better I got at sort of processing stuff and doing things and ticking things off my to-do list, the more I focused on I realised I was focusing on doing all the unimportant stuff, right? Not the stuff that I really cared about. What would happen is I'd have some project that I really wanted to pour my time and attention and energy into. I think, well, that's kind of serious, right? That's like the magazine article that could make a really big difference in my career or make a big difference in the world. It really matters. So I can't do that now, obviously, because I'm kind of tired and I've only got 45 minutes and I've got like 40 emails that need answering. So I'll do that and I'll feel very virtuous clearing the decks. And all that would happen is you would systematically postpone the thing that you, that you really cared about. It's like with reading as well. Sometimes it's like, like there's a book you really want to read, you think it's really important, you want to make sure you're focused on its, on its impact on you, on its lessons it might have for you. So it's never the right time to read that book, right? It's much easier to just go back and reread a thriller that you enjoyed reading last year or something because that actually takes something that you're not prepared to give it in that moment. And the result is that all these attempts to kind of take seriously uh, the limitations on our time end up backfiring in these, in these, in these multiple ways. So we're in a sort of a trap when it comes to time. We're in, we're in a, we're, we have too little of it, too little control over it. The things we do to try to use it well seem to backfire. Um, and my sort of unifying idea, I guess, in the book is that Almost all of the ways we go wrong, we go wrong because actually we have a kind of a secret agenda. We have a, an ulterior psychological motive. It's not brand new thought. This goes all the way back through history of philosophy and psychoanalysis and a whole lot of other traditions. What we really want to do is not make the best use of our finite time, but convince ourselves on some sort of usually unconscious level that we have all the time in the world, that we're immune from the, the finitude of, uh, of being human, that, that we, don't, we don't want to feel what it's, what it's like 
the full consequences of what it means to realize that our time is limited. There's a brilliant psychotherapist, American writer called Bruce Tift, who puts it this way in a book he wrote called Already Free. We don't want to consciously participate in what it's like to feel claustrophobic, imprisoned, powerless, and constrained by reality. Because what does it mean to be finite, really? Obviously, we think about it sometimes in terms of like one day we're going to have to die. But just in terms of daily life, it means that every single decision you make to do anything with a period of time, with an hour or a week or a whole lifetime, in the case of you know, a marriage or a career path or something like that, is by definition a decision not to do a million other things, right? To miss out by definition on a perhaps literally infinite number of other things you could have done. It means that there will always be too much to do, right? There's just no reason to believe that all the things that really feel to you like they matter are going to be able to fit inside the amount of time that you're going to have to do them. And because of the lack of control we have over time, it means always being completely vulnerable to events, you know, never being absolutely able to rule out the possibility that, you know, I'll walk out of this building and a grand piano will fall on my head from a high story or something like that. No matter how much planning or worrying or strategizing or preparation you put in, it's put in. So it means always having too much to do, never having time for all the things that feel like they would be ways that you ought and could, would like to spend your time, and not being able to control the experience. There's this really annoying uh, time management parable that crops up in a huge number of books, and if you've ever read like a classic time management self-help book, you will have encountered it, about the rocks in the jar, and I talk about this a little bit in the book as well. To recap this story, this is about like, it's a, the idea is that like some, it's like a university professor or somebody walks into a classroom and he's got um, a glass jar and some large rocks and then some pebbles and some sand. And he issues a challenge to his students. He says, um, can you fit all of these into the glass jar? And the students, who for the purpose of this story are like really dumb or something, um, <laughs> put all the sand in and put all the pebbles in and then there's no room for the big rocks. And then they put all the pebbles in and then the sand. There's still no room for the big rocks. And then the university professor, because he's clever, um, says, no, no, no. You've got to put the big rocks in first. You put all the big rocks in first, and then all the smaller things can nestle in the spaces between them. And the moral of the story is, if you make time in your life for the priorities that really matter, then you can fit them in and probably fit in a lot of other stuff as well. But if you don't make time for them, you won't fit them in at all. And this story annoys me intensely because it's just completely a scam. It's like it's a complete... Uh, rigged example, because obviously the uh, smug professor in this, in this story has only uh. brought the number of rocks into the classroom that he knows in advance can be made to fit into the large glass jar, whereas the problem that we have uh, as finite humans, especially in the modern world, but it isn't only a question of the modern world, is that there are just far too many big rocks, right? There are far too many things that it would feel meaningful to spend a life on. Here's a great slide that um, an illustrator called Elliot Alexander did for me. That's the, that's the truth about the big rock problem. <clears throat> and um, so, let's go back to what I'm saying. Um, and so all sorts of the things that we think we're doing when we try to make the best use of our time, I argue in this book, drawing on many, many uh, thinkers, are actually efforts to try to convince ourselves that we can find an exception to this rule. We can find some sort of some, uh, loophole in the, the human condition that means that we get to keep on feeling, uh, in some sense, immortal. I think the whole world of time management and productivity and all the rest of it definitely has that at its core, right? It's this notion that if you could only optimize yourself into the perfectly efficient person, then you would not have to turn 
down any opportunities. You would not have to say no to any uh, demands. You would not have to disappoint anybody in your life. You could do everything just through the process of becoming more and more efficient. And obviously there's an enormous external socioeconomic pressures on people to try to, to, try to do that. Uh, Distraction, I think, basically is something similar. It's a sense that like, the thing that we're doing, that we mean to focus on, brings up all these kind of experiences of limitation. You don't know if the project you're working on will come out well. You don't know if you can do it or if you have enough time to do it. To bounce away from something like that to just like scrolling through Twitter for an hour is obviously self-defeating in terms of wanting to spend your life doing meaningful things. But it's actually in terms of the feeling involved, the phenomenology of being online, it's that, it's that sense of like leaving the world of limitation for the limitless world of the internet where you can just sort of float around and not feel bound, not feel imprisoned by reality. Even busyness itself actually serves this, this function. There's this lovely quotation from uh, Nietzsche. We labor at our daily work more ardently and thoughtlessly than is necessary to sustain our life because it, to us it is even more necessary not to have leisure to stop and think. Haste is universal because everyone is in flight from himself. <clears throat> and then procrastination as well. I think a lot of the ways that people procrastinate or don't quite get round to projects that they know they really value, often for a whole lifetime, is because to not start something is to maintain the feeling of perfection, of control of it, right? If it's the best way to stay in tune with the fantasy that a project you're going to launch, a creative work you're going to write, a relationship you're going to embark on, the best way to hold on to the notion that it can be perfect and undamaged by limitations and imperfections of reality is never to start it in the first place. And we all know people like this, right? People who know that they have a novel in them or, or never seem to quite settle down with another person out of a notion that it's like there's something too painful about bringing that into reality. And this is where that thing I talked about, that sense of the provisional life, about always living for the future and never quite living for now, it's where this comes in because if you can convince yourself that you're always living for some future time, that the moment of truth is not quite, never now, but it's always going to be later, well, then there is a kind of a feeling of immortality, a feeling of, of, of always, of, of your life stretching on and on and on into the future forever. You don't quite have to fully engage with life now if you're not quite ready yet. You're waiting till you're more qualified, you're waiting till you retire, you're waiting till the kids go off to university, you're waiting for something. It, 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 it gives you a sort of an out in the present moment. And um, John Maynard Keynes put this brilliantly in, uh, uh, in a line from a, from a famous uh, address in, uh, I think it was 1930. The purposive man, he's talking about people who um, are fixated on using their time as well as they can, is always trying to secure a spurious and delusive immortality for his actions by pushing his interests in them forward into time. He doesn't love his cat but his cat's kittens. Nor, in truth, the kittens, but only the kittens' kittens, and so on forward forever to the end of catdom. So this is where I kind of feel like <laughs> it's sort of, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's sort of immensely alarming and depressing to me anyway to think about how little time we have, how little control we have over the time, how all our efforts to try to make the best use of the time seem to backfire, how um, all our sort of, all the pathologies of, of where we go wrong with time, feeling more anxious than we need to, feeling uh, like it's our job to do more than we possibly can do, f getting distracted when we should be focusing, um, procrastinating when we should be getting involved, holding back from commitments when we should be making commitments, all of this is like just ultimately the human attempt to not have to experience what it means to be finite and it all seems very depressing. I'm always slightly tempted to just sort of stop there. <laughs> <coughs> um, but actually, actually, I think that there is a sense of liberate, a real liberation that is available to us here and it comes from beginning to understand and maybe deepening your understanding of just how 
inescapable the situation of, of finitude is, right? Just how completely non-negotiable the situation is, just how much there is no possibility of doing all the things that feel like they matter. There is no possibility of planning or worrying yourself into a situation of total confidence about what the future is going to hold. It's all completely off the table. And, in a, and actually, it's kind of the, it's the hope that kills you, right? Because it's the, it's the thought that there might be a way out of this that keeps us internally scrambling to try to get to this position, to try to get our lives in full working order, as uh, Arnold Bennett put it. And technology actually exacerbates this problem because every new development, every new way in which things speed up and can be done faster and, and, uh, and at least superficially easier, holds out the promise that we're like, we're almost there. We're almost at the point where we don't have to be um, bounded by these, by these limits, by the limits of finitude. And if you can just sort of fall back into the reality of it and see that that is never coming, that the time in your life when you don't have problems related to being finite is just like, that's not something that ever happens in a human life. That's actually when you're free, right? Because you get to give up or at least loosen your grip a little bit on that struggle to do something that was impossible all along. I think modern Western philosophy is quite bad at this idea about the role of these kinds of insights in offering real transformation in how you, in how you relate to the world. And I've always found it much more eloquently phrased in Zen, Buddhism, and some other Eastern philosophies. Here's a line that I use in the front of the book from an American Zen Buddhist, Jocko Beck, who wrote, what makes it unbearable is your mistaken belief that it can be cured. This is one of those, like, at first glance, or to a first approximation, um, depressing uh, observations that is actually, I think, ultimately, uh, can be, anyway, if the words happen to resonate for you, extraordinarily liberating, this notion that the only way we have been going wrong is to think that there might be an out. There might be a way to not have to live with the feeling of being imprisoned by reality. Here's an, uh, the, the, that we might be able somehow to, 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 to make time for all the things we felt we needed to make time for, to, to exert the kind of control we might have craved. Here's another, also American Zen uh, master, Mel Weitzman. Our suffering is believing there's a way out. And uh, just to complete the, the Zen uh, triumvirate, there was a um, an British-born Zen master called... Uh, Jiu Kennett, Peggy Kennett, who, um, who said that her teaching style was um, not to lighten the burden of the student, but to make it so heavy that he or she would put it down. And I think this is a really, like, I find this really inspiring and sort of moving. It's, this, it's another way of saying this, I think, is that, like, the solution to our problems in respect of time, but very often with respect to other big sort of life problems, is to realize that it's worse than we thought. <laughs> to realize that the problem that you have, it, like you f it feels really hard to try to fulfill all the obligations that weigh on you in life. It feels really hard to get to the point where you feel in control of things. It feels really hard to um, make time for the people and the things, all of them, that matter. But it isn't really hard. It's completely impossible. And that's a really, really powerful shift, I think, from the way you go from really difficult and I've got to beat myself up trying to make it work to, oh, not part of the human gift, actually. Not something that we, not something that we get to do. <clears throat> and um, I write in the book, I mean, this is a gradual process for me. I'm still definitely sort of feeling my way into it. But I did have this sort of miniature epiphany on a, on a park bench in Brooklyn, where we lived at the time. Um, at the beginning of a middle of a week where I had some far even more on than usual and I was just feeling really anxious and overwhelmed and trying to figure out like what combination of weird little time management tricks I'd learnt from dodgy books I was going to use to get through everything that I felt I needed to get through. And just having that realization of like, oh, oh it can't be done. It's impossible. 
and the, and the, 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 the sense of a burden being lifted that happened uh, in that moment. And the consequence of this, I can talk if people are interested in the, when we uh, do questions and things about specific ways that this manifests in different life situations, but just that notion of not trying to clear the decks every, all the time before you begin things that really matter to you. Um, letting things take the time they take, letting things like reading or certain kinds of relationship just take the time they take without always trying to force the pace. So many very small ways in which like falling back into the, the experience of being finite has, has really made a difference in, in my life anyway. And just to close this up, I suppose, really, I think it's really interesting to compare these kinds of modern time experiences that I've been talking about to what we can speculatively think would have been the experience of, to quote the example I give in the book, but there are others, like an early medieval English peasant in Yorkshire, say, right? But people who had really, really terrible lives in almost every way that you can imagine compared to your life today, but who I think it's reasonable to assume would not have experienced time problems, would not have felt like they had too much to do in the time available or felt guilty about wasting some time or, or like they were feeling the pressure of time. Because all of these ideas of time as something that we're fighting, time as a tyrant, it's a very sort of, it's an idea that really gets going with the development of clocks and then with industrialization for various obvious and maybe less obvious reasons. But before then, at least for an ordinary person, I think they're just, th th this sense of um, there being you and then time, and you have to kind of like organize your activities relative to time, use time well like it's a resource. I didn't think any of that would have arisen. Um, this is, the alternative here is a way of being that anthropologists call task orientation, right? This idea that the rhythms of life just emerge from what you are doing. This is why it's more prevalent people living closely to the rhythms of nature. And time was just the medium in which life unfolded. Um, if you sort of had a couple of cows that you, that you milked every time they needed milking and that was one of the things you did to subsist and some productivity guru came along and said like, you've got to batch your projects, right? You've got to do all the milking for the year in two weeks so because then you won't be bothered by the cost of task switching and all it's obvious nonsense right it's nonsense you just have to milk the cows when the cows need milking and this sort of sense of being in and of time instead of in a relationship where you're trying to deal with or use time is so um all encompassing that it's actually really difficult i think based on some it's all, you know, scraps of evidence, of course, but it's really difficult to talk about quantities of time for people in that kind of mindset because you don't have, like, you, you can't easily talk in terms of clock periods. And um, the great historian E.P. Thompson, in a, in a famous paper he wrote, talks about the way that um, uh, when you did need to compare things you were doing to other, to, to, when you did need to sort of put a, a time on things, you would end up sort of comparing them to other things, to, su to suggest that it took about the same time as that thing. So you find references in the, in, in the uh, record to um, something taking a miserere while, the amount of time it took to um, say the, the miserere from the Bible, or a pissing while. Um, and, and I think there is a kind of a, for all the very horrible lives of medieval peasants, I want to be clear that I'm not uh, glossing over that, I think there is a certain kind of deep peace in this unalienated relationship with time. This idea that time is just the medium in which life unfolds instead of something you've got to always be uh, using well, maximizing the value of. Now we can't go back to that and there are many reasons we wouldn't want to, but I think it's something useful to keep in mind because it can encourage us to see, just to finish up here, that there's there's something really odd about the basic way that we think about time today. There's something really strange about the idea that we have it. A bit like we have physical possessions or have money or something like that. Because you never actually have time, right? You just get one moment and then the next moment and then the next moment. <clears throat> and all our sort of 
time pressures, all our fighting with time comes from this in some sense, flawed assumption, even though it has a lot of uses in day to day, but that but, but, but we, that time, we, we're given this sort of chunk of time. In fact, all we have is every moment that we are. And I think that this very famous um, quote from uh, Jorge Luis Borges um, really performs this perspective shift for me, anyway, when I read it. Time is the substance I'm made of. Time is a river which sweeps me along, but I am the river. It is a tiger which destroys me, but I am the tiger. It is a fire which consumes me, but I am the fire. And I think if you can sort of feel into this way of uh, thinking about time, even while you do have to answer your emails or keep appointments that you've made with people in your diary, there's a possibility of finding a sense of not freedom from time, which is the thing we always thought we wanted, uh, freedom from the constraints of being human, but freedom in time, right, where you become more wholeheartedly the person that you are and already are. And one obvious way in which this is liberating, um, this is a, I always like to quote um, Anna from Frozen 2 as a philosophical source, although it does occur in the writing of Carl Jung as well, is that because you only get each moment, one moment at a time, or, or to be more specific, you find yourself as each moment, uh, one after another, you only ever actually have to, to quote Anna from Frozen, do the next right thing, or to quote Carl Jung, do the next most necessary thing. Like, that's literally the only obligation on any of us, no matter how um, sort of stressful or burdensome our life situation. There is, the nature of our relationship to time is that there is only ever, like, one moment that we have to uh, deal with. And uh, I think that that can go along with, you know, a realization that we're never going to get our lives into full working order or whatever Arnold Bennett's phrase is. And that we're also in some sense sort of denying life by spending so much time trying. Uh, and that it makes more sense and is a lot more peaceful to sort of drop back down into the full reality that we're in to give up hope of doing things that are absolutely impossible and always were impossible and as I say at the end of the book you know to roll up our sleeves and get started on what's gloriously possible instead so thank you for listening that's what I have to say I really appreciate your um, giving me a few minutes of your time thank you <laughs>